second webinar for um, the bleaching webinar series for Coral Watch. And today we have got an amazing speaker, Dr. Nicola Browning, and she's the coordinator for the Coral Reef Ecology course at Heron Island. She has obtained a PhD at James Cook University in Marine Science in 2011. And shortly after she moved to Singapore for a postdoctoral position, investigating the impacts of shipwork induced sediments resuspension on coral reefs and seagrass communities. She then came back to Australia in 2014, where she took up teaching focus oh, position in experimental biology at Curtin yeah. University so, in Australia. So yeah, and then she got awarded the uh, yeah. DEPRA in 2018. Yeah. So, so her research, all, guys, maybe the I microphone. Her, re her research focuses on uh, cabinet budgets on coral reef as well as reef associated island stability. She has worked uh, on turbid reefs on the Great Barrier Reef uh, in Western Australia, Borneo, Madagascar and Singapore, investigating increased resilience of turbid water corals to rising sea surface temperatures using different measures of coral physiology and growth. And so Today, Nicola is going to present about the evidence of turbid coral reefs, resilience to marine heat waves. And now I'm going to uh, give her the presentation. Go, Nicola, go for it. All right, I'll just share my screen. Um, I'm going to go slideshow. Can you guys see that or not? Do you see the presenter mode? Can you guys see the screen or not? Marta, hello, anyone? Still the presenter mode? Uh, I think it's because I've got, uh, how do I disconnect from that? Sorry, Nicola, I could see the screen. You can see the full screen, not presenter mode? Uh, I could see um, the presenter mode before. Right, yeah, presenter just... mode. I just put them in the path and I've got two string screens connected. Zoom doesn't like it. All right, let's try that. How's that? Better? So that's just a, yes, perfect. This is perfect. Okay, right. Awesome. Okay. All right, thanks for the intro, Marta. Um, like I said, my name is Nikki Brown. I'm a core reef ecologist at the University of Queensland. I've been here about six months and prior to that I worked at Curtin University in Perth in Western Australia for about eight, nine years there. Uh, and during my time there, I worked with two amazing PhD students, Adi. So one presenting today is one of Adi's um, PhD thesis chapters. Um, she wasn't able to present today, so I'm presenting on her behalf. Um, so this is this is her work that we've done together and we're about to publish it, fingers crossed, um, in the coming months as well. Okay, so that's how to do to acknowledge my country. So I acknowledge the owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. I would like to pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And I also recognize their wide and valuable contributions to Australia and the broader global community as well. So as Marta mentioned, I've worked on turbid reefs for a long time and I have a strong affinity for them. They're, they can be very hard environments to work in. Um, when you're trying to collect data in one to two meter visibility, it just takes longer um, and it can be a bit frustrating, but they're really worthwhile reefs to work on. And we're starting to see, I guess, the value of these reefs in terms of conservation and how these reefs might be able to give us a bit of hope when it comes to things like reaching events. So a couple of years ago, Adi and myself and a couple of the colleagues put a paper together about turbid reefs. And I guess one of the, the main drivers was to try and demonstrate there are different types of turbid reefs. So the first thing was that you could have reefs that were naturally turbid. So they have initiating turbid conditions, they've accreted in turbid conditions. It's not something that we humans have led to turbidity um, as such. These are natural turbid reefs. So you can see on the left-hand side, these are sorts of things that might um, be the reason why we've got turbid reefs, flooding, wave suspension, currents, tides, and rivers as well. Now, of course, we also have those reefs that used to be clear water. And um, because of activities in that coastal zone, so deforestation, dredging, or ag agriculture, that has led to increase in sediments being delivered to that coastal zone. It has resulted in a, um, a, a change in the environment and a degradation of that once clear water reef. 
So the important thing is to understand the different types of turbid reefs and that these reefs might be, because of that, they might be less stressed or more stressed, depending on what their natural background um, situation is. So this is, is a one metric of water quality. Um, we know that most corals are autotrophs, they need light um, for the algae to photosynthesize and pass on their energy. So if you reduce the amount of light entering or that, that entering the depth with it can have a detrimental effect on the coral growth of the algae. So we can measure turbidity in terms of how much is spent okay. in the water column. This can be composed of both organic and organic material. I got the same one. Can someone turn their mic off who's talking? It's a bit difficult. Right, thank you. Um, this can be composed of both organic and inorganic material, um, and that's limited to that coastal zone, either through um, obviously rivers and flood events, but also from respension from waves in that, that coastal zone environment. So they're near yeah. shore, typically shallow environments. Um, as I mentioned before, they can be natural or turbid. And one of the things that the paper wanted to do was to try and, I guess, like when does a reef become turbid? I've learned from my experience of working on different types of turbid reefs. We all have a perception of what a turbid reef is. Um, on inshore Great Barrier Reef, the reefs that I've worked on, you're looking at one two meter visibility if you're lucky, maybe five days a year you can actually see the reef. Similar situation in Singapore, whereas when I moved to WA, there were some reefs that were kind of semi-turbid, five, six meters, but pretty good, but they thought that was really turbid. So it's this perception and background experience that can influence what you classify as turbid. So we thought, well, why don't we try and put, stick a number on that? And we found it was impossible. There's not enough data out there to essentially say, this is when a reef becomes turbid. It's really hard to collect that data. You need data loggers, they're expensive, um, and they typically putting them in a really, um, like, you know, lots of algae is growing on them and crusters and sediments settling on them. The loggers often break down, it'd be really frustrating. So it's really, really hard to get high quality in situ turbidity data. But we're able to kind of, I guess, classify them in terms of these three things that you see here. So reefs that are, essentially turbid most of the years. They're persistently turbid. Yes, there's some variability over time, but they're typically at least a moderate level of turbidity. You then get the reefs like I work on in WA, which we will talk about shortly that are fluctuating. So there'll be periods of the year where they look pretty good. You get my 10, maybe 15 meters, 15 meters visibility. Also there's three, four months a year where they're very, very turbid because of cyclones coming through or big low depressions of rain coming through that pushes lots of sediments into those near shore coastal environments. And then you get those reefs that are transitional. So they might have been clear water, but over time they're transitioning to a much more turbid environment. And those are the ones that typically have suffered from sort of human activity that's led to that increase in sediment delivery to their coastal setting. So one of my bugbears is that everyone thinks that turbid, not everyone, but I guess um, historically people often thought that turbid reefs weren't as valuable in terms of their conservation um, or their, their value conservation wise. And they were considered to be the degraded cousins compared to their clear water counterparts. And that assumes that they used to be clear water. There's been a degradation over time, which is not necessarily always the case. Um, and it's this idea we need to appreciate all reef types if we want to conserve our reefs globally and understand that these different reef types are something different to the table. And the way that they're functioning, responding to environmental change could be really important in our conservation outcomes as well. So up until 10 years, it wasn't a huge amount of turbid reefs, but certainly increasing as we're seeing the value in these reefs. And we're starting to see there's some really interesting, important conservation in terms of how they're responding to bleaching events. So for example, in the Great Barrier Reef, this is a reef that I'm very familiar with, Plume Shells. I spent three, four years diving every two weeks on this reef. And a friend of mine, Carl Morgan, he was out there in 2013 and he did a coral cover survey and it was about 48%. And then following that mass mortality bleaching event in 2016, which really hit those northern and central reefs, um, coral cover actually hadn't declined, actually went up to about 55% about six months after when he went back to that reef and had a look at it, expecting it to be worst case. Whereas reefs just off offshore from Plumichol saw significant declines in coral health. There was something about the natural environmental setting that was protecting these corals from that um, marine heat wave event. In Singapore, so they had a quite big bleaching event back in 2010. So uh, James Guest wrote a paper about it. And so quite a lot of colonies did bleach, about two thirds. 
but the recovery was incredibly rapid and there was no significant change to diversity. So again, these reefs are showing the ability to be highly um, resist resilient, able to bounce back following that acute stress event. And so back in 2021, myself and Dean Shannon, um, there was a, a, a you know, marine heat wave coming through Exmouth Gulf. So here's Exmouth Gulf here. It's about halfway down the coast of WA on the western side of Australia. And we've got four reef sites here. So we've got um, Bundigi in this little blue box here. Sorry, Somerville in this blue box here. That is our the most turbid site there. And then we had Eva and Fly, so kind of intermediate turbidity sites. And then Bundigi, which is on the west coast of um, the Gulf, which is our clear water site. And you can see Ningaloo Reef just starts here. So Ningaloo Reef goes all the way down the coast from here. So obviously that's a UNESCO site. Um, and there hasn't been much tension at Exmouth Gulf until quite recently because people are starting to realise there's reefs in here, they're really valuable, um, which is really great to see um, happening as well. So back in March, we did our first surveys. At each of the four sites, we did um, three sets of one shallow and one deep site. When I say deep, it's about sort of six, seven metres, not particularly deep. Um, and we did 50 metre transects. On these transects, we took 25 photos of half metre quadrats. And those photos were analysed for benthic composition, coral composition, coral cover, but also in terms of the level of bleaching, so whether it's normal, all the way up to 100%. And we use that data to calculate what's known as the bleaching index, um, which is based off equations as published by McClanahan in 2004. And we calculated those numbers for per genus, for per coral morphology, so branching, massive folios uh, or encrusting, and also um, for the site as well. Now, we also had data loggers in situ at each of these sites, the temperature and turbidity. Unfortunately, the loggers um, didn't play ball during this time frame, as is quite common, um, but we're able to use satellite data to get a proxy for that instead. So again, these are our four sites. So some of the ones are most turbid, going down to our clear water site, Pondigi. So you can see here in terms of uh, sea surface temperatures, Pondigi, the clear water site, had the warmest temperatures in the winter months, but the coolest temperatures in the summer months. So this was the only site that didn't hit 30 degrees during that, that summer period when bleaching was occurring. Um, so again, cooler during summer, but also the least variable and most stable out of those four sites, whereas Mandigi, our most turbid site, experienced the highest temperatures, but also the lowest in the winter. So the most variable site in terms of temperature. And you can see that when we look at the um, SST anomalies, we can see big anomalies in winter, but also in summer. And importantly, in terms of degree heating weeks, we can see again that our most turbid site had two to three times the level of heat stress compared to our most clear water site. So um, all four sites we saw bleaching at, but remember that clear water site, about three week degrees heating week compared to sort of eight, nine for our most turbid water site. So our proxy for turbidity was KD490 derived from satellite data. So the higher the number, the more turbid the site. And again, you can see at some of all, we've got um, higher turbidity levels and consistently higher throughout the year. So looking at our benthic cover, so we've got hard coral, soft coral, macroalgae. And um, we have our two time periods, March, which is during the bleaching event, and about six months later, looking at the recovery from the bleaching event. And then we have our four sites. Um, so you can see that the hard coral cover during the bleaching event was between 20 and 30% across all sites. So pretty good for reefs um, in the region. Soft coral cover was consistently low across all the sites at about so 1%. And macro gulp was quite variable. Um, Bundigi, you can see it was sitting about 10%. Some of all was sort of about that 30%. So there was a slight increase in turbidity, but not um, significant. Following the event, at our two extreme sites, at our clear water site and at our turbid site, there was no change in hard coral cover. Whereas when we look at our two intermediate sites, we saw a significant drop in hard coral cover. Other changes, there was some increase in soft coral cover, but nothing significant. Um, but the two sites that we saw decline in hard coral cover were the two sites we saw an increase in macro algal cover. Not significant, but there was an increase in macro algal cover following um, the warm water event. So if we look now at coral composition, so in total across all the sites, we had 37 coral genuses recorded. Eva had the highest diversity. Um, I can't see the number there, it's covered. But 31 corals and Bandigi had the lowest at 14. So I should also mention that back in 2011, Bandigi suffered from a huge bleaching event that knocked out coral cover from, I think it was over 50% to less than 5%. So it's taken a while for that coral cover to recover. So I think that's obviously impacted the diversity at that site as well, despite being a clear water site. 
Um, but here we've got the eight most common um, coral genera observed across all the sites. So you can see at Bundigi during the event, um, dominated by acroporas, and we've got lots of poxoporas there as well. So lots of branching corals here versus a very different assemblage at our three eastern or more turbid water sites, which are typically had lots of turbid areas, so your folios corals, lots of parietes, so your big massive corals, and lots of goniastries, which were more kind of encrusting submassive morphology. So in terms of these eight most dominant coral genera, there were no significant changes um, following the event, but the changes that we did see, the declines that we saw in those two intermediate sites were due to the more rarer um, species, but it wasn't really differences in composition that changed, but differences in morphology that changed significantly as well, which I'll show you here. So here we can see that so there were differences in bleaching, but it was which corals were bleaching between sites varied as well. So on a water site, you can see here, there's a massive, um, I think it's Lyphastria that we can see here that's bleached here, with lots of algae around it. Here we've got at fly, this was at the intermediate site, we've got a couple of um, bleached corals in the back here. Um, we've got a healthy Goniopera here and a semi-bleached um, Favia here. At Eva, we've got a big Astriopora that's severely bleached, but right next to it, beautiful, healthy tabulate Acropora and some beautiful Turbinaria down here. And on a clear water site, very differences and difference in responses. So some Acropora were totally fine. Other Acropora you can see that was severely bleached. So it was difference in the morphology between the sites that seemed to be driving the differences in the site responses. So we have a look at the bleaching index values here. So we didn't find any failures corals at Bundy. That's why that's not there. And the blue dot's not there. We see across all four sites, flies coral didn't really bleach. They seem to be happy. And again, remember, some of all had three times the heat stress that Bundigi had. But regardless, not much bleaching in these particular coral morphologies. Looking at the bran branching with the next least um, impacted by the bleaching event, which is unusual. These are the ones that you consider to be more sensitive to bleaching events. Um, it was the highest at Bundigi, our clear water sites. So again, our clear water site that. Um, What's my little arrow? Where's it gone? There we go. Um, so a clear water site, but again, it's three degree heating weeks. And what, what we see can see here is there is a decline in bleaching as we get more turbid, but also as temperatures were increasing as well. So I'm not suggesting that the temperature is resulting in decrease in bleaching, but it's the fact that there's something about the turbid environment that might be protecting these corals from that bleaching event. And the two corals that bleach the most, which are consistently high across all the sites. Um, was our folio, sorry, our encrusting and our massive corals. So differences in responses um, in the different morphologies that was evident across all four of those sites. Um, we also did some PCA and we saw distinct um, site groupings. You can see that, um, and these, these are based on the mean bleaching index per transect. So you can see that there was more similarity within a site than between sites. Um, what's really interesting here is that we can see that those sites that had higher bleaching index are going this direction were the sites that had the lower maximum temperature. So this way you've got maximum temperature, temperatures here. So the sites that had the higher BIs actually had the lower. So temperature wasn't really driving these patterns. It was something else. We can also see that the sites that had higher beaver IIs also had lower turbidity. So again, it's probably this relationship with temperature and BI is more to do with the fact that these sites also had high turbidity that's protecting um, the corals from um, suffering the most from that marine heat wave event. We also did some multilinear regression uh, and we created a model that explained over half the variation in BI, which is really great. But we found in that model, it was the coral morphology that was the main influence. And we looked at the differences between the coral morphologies. We saw that folios had significantly lower BI values than branching, and branching had significantly lower BI values than encrusting and our massives. So putting the environment data in certainly improved the model, but really it was the coral morphology and how the differences they were responding that was driving the, the explanation, explaining the BR differences across the whole range of transects. The take homes is that these reefs, these turbid reefs, are experiencing higher temperatures, but greater resilience. That Somerville site had three times the amount of heat stress that had the same level of resilience in Bandigi, which had a third of the heat stress. So we saw that coral composition at those two extremes didn't really change. Um, and those extremes were characterized by the two morphologies that were least impacted by the bleaching. So by Diggy, we had lots of branching corals, and we had lots of folios corals. Whereas on the flip side, the two intermediate um, 
uh, turbid sites, fly in either, dominated by massive and encrusting corals. Those are ones that had the higher bleaching index values. As I mentioned before, we typically think branching corals to be more sensitive to um, bleaching events. Um, but here we saw um, actually as temperatures increased, bleaching index seemed to decrease, but again, probably due to the fact we've got the interplay with sediments and turbidity protecting those, those branching corals. So the question is, why is it that the massive and encrusting corals in this scenario seem to be the least resilient to that marine heat wave? And so Adi and myself kind of came up with this idea that because these morphologies are quite flattened, um, when you've got a sort of flat surface and sediments are settling onto that surface, that's an additional stress. It's causing stress for the coral, tissue necrosis. And so when you've got those two combined sources of heat and sedimentation, it might be just too much for those, those corals in that environment. Whereas your more vertical profile ones, your branching ones, or your foliage ones tend to be sort of this kind of shape, there's less sediment settling onto the tissue surfaces on their skeletons, which can, which can cause that additional stress. So Bandigi, we had those low BI values, we had low heat stress and more branching corals, um, whereas some of all we had potentially this screening or shedding of sediment. So bleaching, yes, it's caused by high temperatures, but when you've got lots of UV light, that can accelerate the bleaching rates. So sediments in the water column, they reduce the UV light and that can help reduce the amount of bleaching occurring. Another important thing is that Sediments are actually another form of nutrition. Corals can feed heterotrophically. So when they're bleached, they lose their algae, they lose their main energy resource. They can still get energy through heterotrophic feeding, through like plucking out sediments from the water column using their polyps. And so that allows them to survive the energy deficit during that stressful period. But that might only be for those corals that have that more vertical profile that aren't being impacted by that negative association with sediment settling onto the skeleton and tissue. In terms of conservation, well, it's predicted that turbid reefs are going to increase in terms of their distribution through to both local impacts, but also global from sea level rise. And therefore, we need to understand how these reefs and the corals on these reefs are going to respond to, to, to environmental change. Because what we're seeing is that there's something special about these corals on these reefs. And so we need to understand that, to harness that, and to conserve these reefs and not just as they're not important anymore. And so, them conservation efforts 50 reefs initially which is really great and only one of the reefs they included was a marginal extreme reef and that was a turbid reef off the mouth of the, the amazon river which they only found about 15 years ago because no one thought there'd be a reef complex there and it's huge and it's amazing and so it's about recognizing these reef types um, and what they bring to conservation for our reefs moving forward and so thank you for listening any questions Thank you so much, Nicola. That was great. I love it. Thank you. No worries. I actually particularly love personally turbid reefs. So oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually have a question. So in one of your graphs, where there was the soft coral, because I'm particularly interested in soft corals, uh, although there was a really significant change in the October months, there was a bit of a no. high, um high cover of soft corals. So what's the what's the sort of cover and like kind of distribution abundance of soft corals in that area? In those um it's pretty low. Yeah. I mean it's you, yeah, there's not really many soft corals in that area. Um and in general, like I haven't I don't see many soft corals on turbid reefs, certainly not on inshore Great Barrier Reef, and I didn't really see many in Singapore either. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if you've had a different experience, but I don't, they've never really been a big part of the turbid reef story for me. The only place actually, in, while I was diving in Borneo, there's quite a few, that's probably the only place, but that, that's a really interesting turbid reef system because it's just off, offshore from the Barren River. Mm -hmm. uh, in sort of northern Borneo, central northern Borneo, huge reef complex going from sort of 10 metres down to reefs off at 40 metres. Um, and there's certain reefs there that, that are characterised by lots of soft coral communities, but it's they're very different. They're quite flat reefs, and they're, they're characterised by encrusting and massive corals, not many branching corals. Um, so very different reef system there. But apart from that, I haven't really seen many soft corals on reef on turbid reef systems. Okay, yeah, because I was thinking more like about the Palm Island, so like Orpheus, Pelorus, that area. So there's, yeah, okay. Because I was doing my work actually on Gorgonian soft corals there. So oh, yeah, of, yeah. Uh, reefs there some of them actually like you say there's lots of hard corals and especially plate corals but um there's a lot of like soft coral kind of taking over 
I think uh, Mike Kingsford was doing some work. I don't know if you were diving around Polaris. Um, I haven't like, been to Polaris, no. Yeah, I mean, you can get fake towards the soft core communities. It's not always to sort of algae. It can be towards soft core community yeah. as well. Um, yeah, for sure. And I was also interested in Singapore because I, I was actually reading some papers um, in the past about soft corals in turbid reefs, but I've got no idea what sort of um, reefs are there and how turbid they are, yeah. you know. Yeah, like I mean, Singapore's interesting because, you know, we only really have antidotal evidence of what the reefs were like prior to the 80s. Um, and so there's evidence that, you know, these reefs were clearer, like 10, 15 metre visibility. Um, and they've been trying to collect some reef cores on these reefs to look at, you know, were these reefs clear water prior to the, you know, big development boom that happened in the 80s and 90s in Singapore. And so um, my gut feeling that these reefs were always turbid, but it's obviously gotten worse. Um, yeah. But again, there's, there's not a huge soft coral community there either that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, yeah, the Singapore, yeah, everyone, I think everyone makes the assumption that there used to be clear water and certainly they used to be clearer. But I think, yeah, there's there's definitely an element of, you've got the reef system from Malaysia that's that's coming out that's been, you know, that's been impacting those reefs for pre, you know, development there as well. So, yeah. um, but they have got reef cores from there, but I haven't seen the data yet for them. So it'd be interesting to see what comes from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Any other questions from the participants? You can also write. Hi, Hi. Hey, so with the XMA stuff, did, do you know if at that same time there were surveys done on Ningaloo Reef? Um, I don't think so. No, I mean, there, there's this. Was, I think this is one of the first surveys because Adi and I were like, "Well, has anyone done any bleaching surveys?" And they, there was a 2011 big bleaching event that impacted a lot of a lot of the reefs along that coast from the Dampier region all the way down to Ningaloo including yeah. Bundigi, which basically wiped it out. But there's been no other bleaching surveys in the region. We just, there's not, there's no data on, on bleaching in that region, um, which is quite interesting. But one thing that's interesting as well is that, you know, a typical year, um, but for example, in Dampier Archipelago, where my, where my other PhD students is working, they just had, this summer, they had 15 degree heating weeks and there was a bleaching event there, but it's quite common to get 15 degree heating weeks in WA, um, whereas mm -hmm. obviously in the Great Barrier Reef, anything above six is is a problem. So there's there's some level of resilience to bleaching in WA because they are experiencing quite frequently higher levels of degree heating weeks, but we just don't have enough data to really understand, understand how the communities are responding to that. Because it would be so interesting to see the data of the inshore x miles Gulf compared to the, let's say, offshore um, Ningaloo Reef part yep. to see how that responded at the same time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that might said that those inshore regions are also a lot warmer as well. I mean, you can see from that data, we've got, yeah. you know, nine, eight, nine degree heating weeks and just, you know, a few k's away, it's only three degree heating weeks because it's obviously shallower and obviously my, my fluctuates much more in terms of the temperature. So, right. but yeah, we just think it's not, it's not enough data out there at all from WA. So, um, Ma, as Marta said, we just did surveys around Polaris and, uh, the other one, uh, or Orpheus, all around, yep. and it's very characteristic that on the outside it's really healthy, dense core cover, uh, hard coral, and on the inside it's a mixture of hard and soft coral. Um, okay, I can show you uh, later. Yeah, I was always thinking how how again it goes oh. to that question I made at the point. It's like how turbid is it? Because I think the really turbid reefs, the soft corals don't do very well at. Um, I said Middle Reef and Pluma Shoals and that really inshore sediment prism um, near Townsville. I mean, there's just like there was zero. And I mean, these are reefs that like to you know you you're guaranteed about one to two meter of visibility when you jump on those reefs. Um, so very very turbid reefs. Whereas I think reefs yeah. that more kind of fluctuating where you might get some days that are ten. You know, I think maybe soft corals might be able to. Um, be in those sorts of environments, but are those really chronically turbid reefs like Singapore, like you just don't see them in soft corals there. Yeah. So we did also surveys around the family group, which is in front of Mission Beach, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there we were also amazed how good the coral was doing in the yep. turbid environment and actually also how seagrass was doing pretty well in the turbid Oh, yeah, yeah. I said so, so many of these turbid systems, the, the coral covers, you know, like Plumer Shoals is a perfect example where it's beautiful. You just can't see it. 
are the five mm. days of the year where it's beautiful and still in calm because it's caused by the way we suspension is the main driver of stability. And so, like, yeah, four or five days of the year, it's amazingly calm and you're like, oh, my goodness. Like, it's just there's coral. It's literally cut the carpets of coral. It's beautiful. Um, and it's a turbid reef system, you know, that it's not supposed to look like this. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks for it. Any other question from the participants? I I have one question, if I can. Yeah, sure. Hi, Christine. Hi. Um, my question is, I'm aware of a study that has been done in 2007 by Hugh et al. He has been linked the resilience of um, bleached corals to the presence of um, herbivorous fish that uh, help control algae growth. So did you have a look at um, fish coverage at all? Um, so on most turbid reefs, there's not like the fish populations are very different from uh, clear water reefs. So there's not only is there a low abundance, there's a low diversity. So there, there are some sort of herbivores in terms of the damsel, damsel fish. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, again, it's really hard to collect that data in these environments because typically yeah. you collect that data through visual surveys, yeah. um, and it's just really hard to get a good understanding mm. of that. Yeah. Um, so in, I'm sure they I'm sure they'll be playing a role of, in terms of you know maintaining lower levels of macroalgal cover because obviously mm. as soon as corals are stressful they're, they're not going to be growing as fast and they can't yeah. compete with the other benthic components such as the algae. So I'm sure they play a really important role. But it's something I think it's just it's been really hard for us to get a handle on exactly mm. what that role is on these turbid environments um, because yeah. the data is just so hard to collect really. Mm. Um, in, uh, on another side note, we have been looking more at. Um, other types of fish communities such as the coronavores such as the parrotfish and the tusk fish which certainly certainly play an important role in terms of the carbonate sediment story on these reefs mm -hmm. um but in terms of the herbivorous fish it's something that yeah i think needs certainly needs a lot more work on yeah okay thank you any other questions I hope everyone loves turbid reefs now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one last one. Is how did you yeah. get into turbid reefs so much? How did you first get uh, in? That's a great question. Yeah, and it definitely was. Um, so I um, worked in Madagascar for a couple of years for a conservation company. And um, I was a very normal tip in Madagascar in a bay called Diego Suarez Bay. Huge, huge, massive bay system. And we had a remote camp um, out there for a couple of years. And we had training volunteers to come out and do quarry surveys. There'd been no documentation of quarries in the area. We were the first people to dive on this area. It's like, what's there? Like, essentially was the question. And parts of the bay were very turbid. And we were seeing corals. And, you know, up until then, my whole education on coral reef was like, corals need to have clear water environments and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I was like, well... Clearly, they don't. <laughs> there's something. There's obviously they look different, and they had different corals, and you know, they had a different feel about them. And it, it kind of in my brain was like, well, I want to understand this. What is it about this reef that is allowing you know these reefs to exist in an environment that I've been told that they shouldn't be able to be successful in? Uh, and that kind of spurred my curiosity into turbid reef environments. And uh, yeah, and then I got my PH working in that environment, and it's kind of gone from there. Nice. That's really interesting. Where in Madagascar was it? On the big island or small? No, island? the very, very, very northern tip, like the northern okay. tip of um, Madagascar. You'll see, if you, if you zoom in on Google Earth, you'll see this bay with an inlet to the east. Um, yeah, it's a huge bay. And um, okay. yeah, there was yeah, coral reefs in that area. And you've got a, you know, there was varying levels of, I guess, degradation in that bay. Like the northern side of the bay, which was not developed, had some beautiful coral reef communities Southern, southern part of the bay where you had sort of more coastal communities. You had an abattoir, um, which was, yep, feeding all its um, pollution into the quarry from environment. And I remember the day we had to go and recce that area. It was slightly concerning because not only you can see, you're like, there's got to be sharks. <laughs> yeah, um, so, it. yeah, go on. No, you, you go. Yeah, no, I'm actually did a bit of diving up in Nosy Bay. Oh, okay. Yep, yep, yep. And many years ago, a couple of times, like, but yeah, many years ago. So the memories are a little bit <laughs> foggy, but uh, yeah, I remember some really beautiful reefs, but also I remember lots of turbid reefs. Yes. Time. Yeah. There are the, yeah. There are definitely a few turbid reefs in Madagascar for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the pollution was next level. 
Yeah. Bye, girl. See you tomorrow, Nick. Bye, Chris. See you. Yeah. See you tomorrow. All right, so if there's no more questions, I'd like to really thank you, Nicola, for running the webinar today. And I'll see you guys for the third one and last one. Sounds great. Thank you, Marta. Thanks for organizing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.